Central Tennessee. Good evening, everyone. I am Zach Buckner, and I am your host tonight for Live at 5 here on WCTE, Upper Cumberland PBS. Tonight, we have a really great show planned for you. We're so excited, first of all, to welcome U.S. Senator Lamar Alexander. Senator Alexander, thank you so much for joining us tonight via Skype. Well, thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. We have so much to talk about. There's One a lot going to... on, and I want to jump right into it so that we have plenty of time to talk. Uh, first of all, just tell us how have things been in your world? It's been an interesting past few months. Tell us about what it's been like for you. Well, my world's been like everybody else's world. It's been uh, virtual. I'm sitting. I'm sitting here in my office in East Tennessee, uh, where I was, where I chaired a hearing on COVID-19 a couple of months ago that was watched on every television channel in America with Dr. Fauci and all the other administration witnesses. We had a Comcast team up here at 2 a.m. in the morning trying to make sure we had that connection. So I'm as busy as ever, even though the Senate uh, right now is, well, we're in session, but but most of us are, are at home. Absolutely. It's certainly been a time where we've been modifying how we have to do what we are doing. And you have been very busy over the past little bits. And I, I want to get into some specific legislation in just a moment that you've been pivotal in, in helping see through that just got passed. But I want to talk a little bit about uh, kind of you personally and, and your uh, announcement recently. You know, one of my earliest memories as a Tennessee citizen uh, in the world of politics was seeing you on TV in your uh, red and black uh, checkered plaid shirt and uh, flannel shirt. And I remember just thinking how neat that was. And you've served the state of Tennessee so very well for over 45 years now. And we are certainly thankful for you and for your public service. But you've announced your retirement uh, after this term. Uh, talk to us about that and kind of how you arrived at your decision and, um, and, and what you have planned. Well, thank, thanks for the question. Now, here, here's what's left of my red and black shirt. I've got the... My hat. There you go. Where, um, you know, I've been a lucky guy, really. I, I, the people of Tennessee gave me a chance to be governor twice and then three times to be United States senator. So that's 26 years at different times in and out of government. And I've, I've, I've watched our state... Uh, go from having no auto jobs to being, in many ways, the number one auto state. I had a chance to work on legislation that's important, uh, such as uh, what we're talking about in terms of the Great American Outdoors Act. And uh, uh, the legislation a few years ago, you may remember a lot of talk about common core public schools in the upper area. So, I was able to help pass legislation to stop that. So I, uh, I decided that after that amount of time that I should, I should uh, step aside and let someone else serve. And I, I think that's the appropriate thing to do. So I'm, it's like turning the chapter in a book you're enjoying reading. I'm not sure what comes next, but I'm looking forward to it. You've had such a productive and impacting career, as you mentioned, you're governor of Tennessee and, you also served as uh, president of UT and secretary of education. Uh, and you've written a couple of books, and, and I know one of them primarily focuses on encouraging folks to be involved in public service. And that is something that you've certainly exemplified. What are some of the things over your career that you've enjoyed the most about public service? Well, I enjoy the people. You know, I've, uh, when I walked across the state, most people and it was 73 different families um i can still remember walking up through grassy cove and grassy cove in cumberland county on a spring morning and, and i got to know the people of tennessee very well so i've enjoyed that what i really enjoy though is getting up every morning thinking i may be able to do something good for the country and going to bed most nights knowing that i have for example um, we'll talk a little bit about the Great American Outdoors Act. I live right here on the edge of the Great Smoky Mountains. I mean, I, there, there's five miles from here, a campground that's been closed for five years that 5,000 families usually go to, and it's closed because the sewage system doesn't work. Well, we, our Great American Outdoors Act provides money to cut in half the maintenance backlog in all the national parks, including the Smokies, so that campground will be open. That's very satisfying to me. 
It also will help with the roads in Cherokee National Forest and with Chickamauga Park down with our wildlife refuge in West Tennessee with Pearl Harbor Visitor Center in Hawaii with the National Mall. So seeing the results of, of, of legislation and particularly when it affects Tennessee, uh, I've enjoyed that a lot. Absolutely. Well, the Great American Outdoors Act is certainly a historic act. And I don't know that most people here in Tennessee realize the magnitude of the act that just got passed. Talk about the players who are involved in making sure that this act was seen through to completion. Well, there were a lot. It's kind of like a parade. Uh, things, things in Washington in the Senate don't get passed by one person. You've got to get a parade of Democrats, Republicans, outside groups. There were more than 800 uh, conservation and outdoors groups like Duck Unlimited, uh, Ducks Unlimited, many others who were for this, Bass Pro Shops. Um, really, there's Tennesseans are, are, I learned a long time ago, there are more people who buy hunting and fishing licenses in Tennessee than who vote in the Republican primary. So I pay a lot of attention. And uh, the head of the Bass Pro Shops, who was at our bill signing the other day at the White House, told me that that fishing and hunting license sales are going straight up because everybody wants to go outdoors. And you and and where do you want to go? Or you want to go to the national forest where you can hunt or fish, or to the national parks, or the national wildlife refuges. And you don't want to get there and find the road with a pothole in it, a trail that's worn out, uh, a bathroom that doesn't work, a roof that leaks. And that's what people were finding all across the country. So this will cut in half the maintenance backlog at all of our public lands, make that experience a lot better for everybody. And it will do it by using money that we derive from energy exploration on public land. So in a way, it's an environmental burden to drill oil for a bit by making sure that our national parks are in good shape when we go to visit. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we know that the state of Tennessee is really unique in the fact that we have so many natural resources to enjoy. I know that in your career, you've probably seen the state of Tennessee and the natural resources here and the tourism that is generated uh, really make an economic impact. Talk about our state and, and some of the notable items that people may not realize and some of these resources that are out there that we may not realize. Well, you talked about the effect of, of the na <clears throat> national park on our economy. I live the next county over is Sevier County, where Dolly Parton's from, and where Dollywood is. Dollywood is now uh, one of the most popular theme parks anywhere in the world. And Sevier County citizens uh, benefit greatly from the tax revenues derived derived from that. I live in Blunt County. The, the next we do. The new Rocky Fork State Park in Upper East Tennessee that Governor Haslam created is 10,000 acres, and it runs up to three or 4,000 feet. It's going to be one of the most beautiful state parks anywhere, and it'll be very popular. But you can go all throughout our state, whether you're in the Upper Cumberland area or whether you're in West Tennessee, you see a combination of state parks, TVA lakes, uh, national parks. You know, if, if any state appreciated the great American outdoors, I would say it would be Tennessee. My sister actually lives in Blount County, and of course we're from Putnam County, and we have five kids, so we uh, we frequent the Great Smoky Mountains National Park all of the time, and then of course, of course we in the Upper Cumberland enjoy all sorts of state parks. It, it's it's a giant undertaking to make sure that these parks are cared for, and uh, as you said, this act that's just been signed into place was nine point five billion dollars, right? That's right. And you're accustomed to people exaggerating um, or, or arguing in a partisan way. But in this case, everyone agrees that it's the most important conservation and outdoor recreation law in at least a half century. It's been the Eisenhower years since we've had this kind of investment in maintaining our national parks. And there's something called the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which has provided money for state parks, city parks, fishing access, all of that. $221 million to Tennessee over the years, and people for 50 years, more than 50, since 1964, have been trying to get permanent funding of $900 million a year for the Land and Water Conservation Fund. So we did that as well, 
is the $9.2 billion for public land maintenance. Well, wow. you know, it's really nice to hear there's there's certainly a narrative out there that uh, folks never work together in Washington, but we're seeing through this and through the facilitation of you and a, a large team of folks that there are certainly good things happening and there's uh, definitely uh, folks that are working across the aisle to make sure that we're taken care of. This is a, a huge act. As you said, that's got to be a fulfilling thing to know that such an instrumental act got passed, especially in your, your last term here. That's got to make you very proud. Well, it happens more often than people realize. I mean, the, the I'm just thinking back over the bill fixing No Child Left Behind, the 21st Century Cures Act, and uh, a couple of years ago, one bill that I really enjoyed working on was what we call the Music Modernization Act. Our songwriters, and we have a lot of them in Tennessee, weren't getting paid uh, fairly for the royalties for the work they created. And we passed a complicated change in the copyright law. It's the first change in a generation that will make sure that if you're a songwriter and you write, write a song, that you get paid a fair amount for your for your royalties. So it happens more often than you think. And in the case of the outdoors bill, it's important to give President Trump some credit. There were lots of Democrats, the first president who allowed us to use energy exploration money for maintenance on our public lands. And without that, we couldn't have passed the bill. Absolutely. It's so crucial right now that we work together, and it's amazing to hear what has just happened. I know I'm certainly thankful and excited for the work that you've done. And uh, as you said, you know, you referenced earlier that when COVID hit and things were modified, uh, you did not slow down at all. Matter of fact, you've probably been busier than you've ever been in lots of ways. I know something that a lot of American citizens are certainly uh, wondering about and have questions about uh, is the next round of COVID relief that is coming. What can you tell us about what you're hearing as far as the next round of COVID relief for the U.S.? Well, we're in the middle of that, and and <clears throat> there's no reason we can't move ahead. For example, the House of Representatives has passed a bill that has $105 billion. That'd be about $1,200. Student up through the 12th grade, help them go safely back to school. It'd be about $1,500 for every college student, for example, at Tennessee Tech at our community colleges to go safely back to school. There are lots of expenses, whether they're in person or virtually learning, uh, in going back to school in the middle of all this. So the House passed $100 billion, and Senate Republicans and the President have said, we're also for $105 billion. We're also for uh, more money for child care. It's hard to go back to work if you don't have a child care center available to you. We're also agreed on more money for a targeted uh, forgivable loan program for small businesses like the so-called PPP loan that 100,000 Tennessee businesses already have taken advantage of. And of course, we're putting a lot of money into finding, uh, creating more fast diagnostic tests so you don't have to wait in and you can buy COVID uh, treatments, which should be coming on in this fall in another month or so, so that you don't have to worry if you're infected that there's not a medicine available. And finally, vaccines. We're moving more rapidly than we ever had in the history of our country to produce vaccines, and we're hopeful that those are going to be available at the end of the year, so we'll have funding for that as well. So in all those areas, there's no reason that Republicans and Democrats shouldn't be able to agree, even if it is a presidential year with a lot of politics flying. Absolutely. Well, that's certainly promising, and I know as a Tennessee native and as a Tennessee citizen, uh, I want to thank you for all the hard work that you're doing um, again, so many folks look up to you and, the, and your career, and we certainly appreciate you finishing strong in Washington for us as Tennessee citizens. Uh, it's been such a pleasure having you on tonight. Thank you for taking time out of your busy you schedule to join us, and we certainly wish you the best. Yes, thanks for working with you again. All right. People are celebrating the centennial of the 19th Amendment in different ways in different states. The 26th of August was when the 19th Amendment was um, placed firmly within the United States Constitution by the U.S. Secretary of State. But here in Tennessee, we're celebrating that centennial on the 18th because that's when uh, August 18th of 1920, 
that our Tennessee General Assembly, and in fact, the, specifically the Tennessee House of Representatives, voted finally to bring in um, the 19th Amendment to be a part of the U.S. Constitution. And so, you know, we're in a celebratory mode, which is a great thing, and it's a learning opportunity. But more importantly is the fact that the centennial of the 19th Amendment needs to be understood as an opportunity for us to reevaluate and restudy and reexamine and recommit to voting, which is critically important to the democratic process. We as Americans have a responsibility to participate in the franchise, and we worked so hard to make it possible. African Americans um, worked so hard to make the 15th Amendment possible. Um, women worked so hard to make the 19th Amendment possible, and 18-year-olds became eligible to vote uh, with the 26th Amendment, and we cannot abrogate that responsibility. What has happened since the reduction in the authority of the 1965 Voting Rights Act is that the United States has actually gone backwards in certain states, federal authority to um, look at states' individual voting laws were lifted by the United States Supreme Court and there have been regressions that have been unfortunate because we do not have a widespread franchise. So everybody has to understand that the reason why we celebrate opportunities such as the centennial of the 19th Amendment is because we use that as a time to recommit to being American citizens. So how does that apply to um, university students. So for us at MTSU, which is where I teach, and I had a program there called the American Democracy Project for Civic Learning, we uh, are responsible for MTSU votes and for getting our student body out to the polls. And it's true across the state of Tennessee, certainly within higher education. Um, I'm sure Tennessee Tech has a similar program where they're working hard to get students out to the polls. We have to get every Tennessean registered in this fall's important presidential election by the 5th of October. And because we have had um, issues going back and forth about how absentee voting can work and should work in the state of Tennessee, we're right smack dab in the middle of coronavirus. So there are a lot of folks who would like to um, vote by mail. And that's doable if you fit one of 14 categories. So everyone needs to go on the Tennessee Secretary of State's website and read what those categories are. Then you can apply for an absentee ballot and submit it. But what I want to suggest to our students, and in fact to most Tennesseans, if you're capable of getting to the polls, we need the election this particular fall to be definitive and solved on the night of November 3rd. Um, 2020 and everyone needs to get to the polls and they need to know how to do it wisely. So we've learned over the past six months of coronavirus what we need to do. We need to wear masks, we need to wear gloves. If you want to go to the polls, take your own pen, take your um, ID. If you have a Tennessee driver's license, that's a good thing to take. If you do not have a Tennessee driver's license, take your passport, um, but show up at the polls, but be sure you're physically registered by October 5th and then um, early voting starts on the 14th of October. Get to the polls as soon as you possibly can and vote this fall because we have a presidential election in Tennessee. We have a United States Senate um, seat that's open. And of course, we have every single one of our um, nine congressional districts are up for election this fall and our Tennessee legislature seats, both in the House and the Senate. So voting's important. It's critically important, and anyone who believes that one vote does not count or that your vote does not count needs to be have that erased from his or her mind because voting is critical for every single citizen. We all got to do it. Everyone needs to participate. It is a right, and it's a privilege, but it's also a responsibility to vote. So everyone needs to get out and vote. It's a part of uh, maintaining a viable democracy, and if we don't participate, we don't get a voice. Well, we've just heard from Dr. Mary Evans, and, and Dr. Evans has so many connections here in Tennessee, deep roots, uh, and so she certainly has a lot to offer our state. So great to hear from her. 
I want to give you a quick bit of information tomorrow to be looking out for. Tomorrow is WCTE's Day of Support, and we want to encourage you. You can jump online and find out more information about that at WCTE.org. But WCTE is a pivotal staple in our community in the Upper Cumberland and we can only continue our work because of the generosity of those around us. So we want to encourage you, jump on and give to the day of support for WCTE. Let's make sure that our work carries on strong. Now, I am so excited to be joined by one of my really good friends. This is Denny Wayne Robinson, White County Executive. Denny Wayne, thanks for joining us. Zach, it is great to be with you again. We've crossed paths a lot in the <laughs> past few years, worked together, and it's great to see you again. That, right back at you. I, I, when I worked with the Highlands Economic Partnership, I tell people to this day, Denny Wayne, I tell them that one of my favorite parts of that job was meeting you <laughs> and getting to hang out with you down in White County. It seriously was one of my favorite things about that. Well, I, I, the feelings are mutual. I, you, you was a great breath of fresh air. Well, we, we work very well together, and um, it's it's amazing that somehow here on WCTE, they've lined the two best-looking guys in the Upper Cumberland up for one show, right? I was thinking the same yeah. thing myself. And the most humble as well. And most humble. Absolutely. Like, absolutely. 100%. Well, we got a lot to talk about. There's so much going on. <laughs> In White County, we don't have a whole lot of time, so we're gonna we're gonna get to as much as we possibly can. But anyway, tell us about what's going on in White County. How how have you guys been doing through the interesting past few months we've had? Interesting is a is an understatement. <laughs> it has been a, a, a trying time, but the people in White County have been very very resilient, mm -hmm. uh, and businesses have have, have adapted. We they've. Uh, as far as I know, nobody's actually had to close. Wow. So that's that's a great thing. Now we that's had a couple incredible. that took a, a couple, uh, two or three weeks, you know, and, and shut down, did some cleaning, but the businesses kind of had to reinvent themselves. Yeah. And you know, a lot of the uh, restaurants and stuff, you know, started doing delivery, takeout, yeah. touch free. Uh, stuff and right. uh, kind of just reinvent themselves and a lot of the uh, major businesses did that took they had to give them time to maybe do some like uh you know how we all put stuff off right and this is kind of slow area <laughs> it gave us some time to do some maintenance some upkeep some actually uh, uh to make things better in their in their facilities so yeah maybe we, some time to do some strategic planning and that kind of yes thing. We, so we took advantage of it the best we could that's very cool it's neat to see i know that every time i'm in sparta you see mom and pop shops open and thriving through this pandemic mm -hmm. you see large businesses still going after it there's trucks coming up and down 111 all the time from white county so economic development in white county is still booming yes it's, it's still going good you know the, the the small the small uh mom and pop places actually i'm not going to say that they uh did a whole lot better but we wasn't hurt that bad people stayed home people yeah. uh or stayed in our community and and, right. and, and actually they they got to learn more than places they didn't even know we had. And that's so, that's for sure. I know we certainly had an opportunity. I mean, we've lived in the Upper Cumberland uh, my entire life, and I found a lot of mom and pop shops out there that we didn't know existed, and now mm -hmm. they're some of our favorite places. Exactly, and we we've had the same thing. Some of the outdoor uh, opportunities that we have in, in, in well, White County specifically, but the Upper Cumberland, right? Uh, Jackson Kayak, uh, yeah, you know, three hundred, uh, almost probably the. The uh, biggest, uh, second biggest now since Herman, we'll probably talk about in a minute. Absolutely. But uh, uh, probably the, the footprint is the uh, the biggest building, 300,000 square foot or so, full of kayaks. Right. Used to be. Right. Uh, gone, empty. Play, the outdoor activities is, is t people are loving it now. Uh, we can't find a, a kayak. <laughs> you know, they're, 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 they've actually uh, called and said, hey, can you find us employees? We're we need everybody that we can to wow. make kayaks. So yeah, wow. it's it's that's it's it's changed it's changed business in White County. Wow. Well, we had Mayor Ben uh, on the show a couple of weeks ago, and he was talking about they have a kayak uh, let off there in in the middle of town, and mm -hmm. he said they can't keep kayaks there either. So that's good. So mm -hmm. Business is thriving even through the middle of a pandemic for sure. And something I said last week on the show that I think it's so important to point out is economic development work is taking place all over the Upper Cumberland behind the scenes all the time. And just because you don't see it doesn't mean there's not a lot going on as far as economic development goes. I know that you're certainly still working behind the scenes. Talk to us about how economic development is still going through this pandemic. Uh, I tell you, economic development, it, that is a – it. I love it. That That is my favorite part of being a mayor. Yes. That, that, that's what I enjoy the most. And it is. And it, a lot of it is unseen. People don't know what's going on. Right. don't know what you're doing. Even through this, <coughs> this pandemic, we've uh, – well, actually, I, I had a site visit today. Wow. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, very exciting. So not only did I had to prepare for you, I had to prepare for <laughs> that. So I, I, I had a, I've had a busy week. <laughs> but people don't see that because you can't talk about it. Right. You, you know, it's all – 
For years sometimes. Yeah, yeah. for years sometimes. Absolutely. Exactly, exactly it is. And not only that, we've got local businesses that are expanding and taking this time to, you know, right. actually, some of them physically enlarging their footprint. So there's right. a lot goes on behind the scenes that, that people don't, don't, don't see. Absolutely. I know one of those projects that I had the opportunity to kind of see was Herman. And that was one that was years in the making. That's a huge win for why a huge win for White County. And I know a lot of people still don't even know about that. Tell us about that project. Wow, that was a huge win for not only for White County but for the Upper Carpenter. Right. This this is a facility that uh, that if you get the opportunity and take the opportunity, October twenty third is the official grand opening. I think I can officially. I hope I don't get in trouble for officially announcing that. <laughs> there but you October go. the twenty third is the official grand opening for the uh, new Herman facility in White County on Airport Road. But uh, I, I toured it the other day. Uh, Congressman Rowe was in town, Senator Bailey, uh, several of our county commissioners. They have got their first line up and running. They are wow. producing garage doors in <laughs> White County and selling to the world. That's so neat. I, I was telling you earlier mm -hmm. before the show, my wife and I were driving down I-40, and I look over and I see a Herman truck coming off of 111 onto I-40. And it was so exciting to see that because I know how much work that you mm -hmm. and a giant team of people in state economic development and here in the Upper Cumberland economic development, uh, they worked for years on that thing. And it was really a team project. Absolutely. And it went so great. There's so much more uh, going on in White County. Uh, one last thing I want to hit that was really neat is I know that UCHRA and White County have been working together on a commodities distribution state grant. Can you talk just a little bit about that? And Well, yeah, the commodities are uh, very important to the people in, in the Upper Common and White County. And, uh, yes, they are working to, to actually make that even better. It's a good system as it is. We, mm -hmm. We've got a good setup, but having – Actually, adding to the, I guess, the inventory of what you what you get in that thing, yeah. it, it's it's a it's a great program for the for the upper It really is. And pay, I tell you, they haven't give out cheese in thirty years, and still today, people ask for that, that cheese <laughs> that you, you get. It's amazing. <laughs> what's, what's the old phrase? Who took the cheese? Who took, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, absolutely. Well, Denny Wayne, I I want to thank you for being on the show. I know that you are a busy man, especially today with especially the site today. visit and all that's going on. I certainly want to thank you and. I want to encourage everybody. Watt County has so much going on, not just in economic development, but in tourism as well. Mm -hmm. Watt County is one of the most amazing counties in our state when it comes to natural areas. You've got Virgin Falls mm -hmm. and the, the Pocket Wilderness, yes. uh, uh, Sunset Dog Cove, Rock. Yeah, Sunset Rock, uh, Dog Cove. Uh, it's it's just a big bottom area. Yes, uh, thousands of acres. Uh, that, that's uh, creeks. Caves, waterfalls, absolutely, such so forth. Yeah, come visit White County. We we look forward to having you there. Yeah, absolutely. Take some time out of your schedule and go visit Denny Wayne and everyone in White County. They're doing some amazing things. Stop off and eat in some of their great restaurants. It's a great place to spend some time with your family. Here in just a moment, you're going to see a clip referencing our day of support. We encourage you to jump online and take part in that. August 21st marks 42 years of broadcast history for WCTE. To celebrate this milestone, we invite you to make a gift dedicated to your favorite PBS program. All dedications will be acknowledged on air August 21st. Your gift ensures that the programming you've grown to depend on will be here today tomorrow and for future generations make a donation by texting give the number two wcte to four four three two one from one neighbor to another wcte pbs is here for you join us again tomorrow for today's show to re-air again at 5 p.m we will return with a live news show on thursday of next week at 5 p.m thank you for watching